uh, and welcome to another in online seminar. Uh, my name is Thanas Psaltis, I'm a postdoc at TU Darmstadt, and I'm also the chair of this uh, organizing committee. Uh, so before we start with the introduction of today's speaker, let me tell you a couple of things. Uh, first of all, this talk has all the talks in this seminar series are being recorded and the recording will be available soon in the GINA YouTube channel. Um, if you want to discuss more with uh, today's speaker, there's going to be an uh, informal session at Gathertown uh, just after the talk, so stay tuned. I will also uh, post the link uh, for the Gather space uh, of Irina. Uh, another thing is that this is the second to last seminar for this season, and in two weeks we'll have the last uh, seminar uh, that will be given by Michael Vischer, uh, so also stay tuned for that. Uh, now it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Dr. Jan Gloris uh, from GSI. Uh, Jan uh, did his PhD at the uh, Goethe University in Frankfurt uh, in the group of uh, René Reiferth, uh, where he worked in uh, the P-process nuclear synthesis. Uh, then he also worked uh, a couple of more years after his PhD with the same group, where he developed uh, a method to measure radioactive, uh, radioactive capture reactions uh, using rings. Uh, and since 2016, he's working at uh, GSI, uh, the group of uh, Yuri Litvinov, uh, in the same uh, topics. And also he's involved in other experiments that are ongoing at GSI. Uh, so Jan, you can uh, share your screen and whenever you're ready, you can uh, take it away. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Do you see my screen? Yep. Mm -hmm. You get the spotlight. Okay. So thank you again, Thanasis. Um, yeah, today I have the honor to um, give you an extended um, yeah, view on the experiments we do regarding explosive nucleosynthesis with the GSI storage rings um, measuring studying radio radioactive ions. So this is um, part of the accelerator facility um, that, um, that we use. The, the, heart of the, um, the heart of the facility we use is the fragment separator, the ESR storage ring, and the, and the new cry ring facility. Before I dive into the details of these um, uh, devices, let me start with a, uh, with a little nuclear astrophysics. And as you know, this is about the hunt for the origin of the elements. And this hunt usually starts with that famous picture here um, of the solar abundance. And um, as you probably know, there is a lot known about this already. And um, the main features can be explained. I have very rough picture explaining that here. We have a hydrogen and helium, high abundances um, that come from the Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Then we have a region from there to the Iron Peak, um, which is uh, originates from um, stable stellar burning. Um, <clears throat> the Iron Peak is a bit different than the other, uh, the lighter things, but uh, I'll skip this here. And then we have the realm of the heavy element nucleosynthesis. And this is mainly covered by neutron capture um, mechanisms. Here we have um, two big players that also leave their imprint in this, um, um, in this pattern. <clears throat> um, we see the peaks of the R and the S process here. And um, we... Uh, However, maybe um, we, we take a closer look on the nuclear chart to, to see, uh, to learn how these processes actually work on the nuclear level. <clears throat> so here again is shown the nuclear chart. Um, we have neutron number versus proton number and the Big Bang and the fusion region is shown here um, up to the iron. And then we have the neutron mechanisms taking over. There is the slow neutron capture process, the so-called S process, which occurs at moderate temperatures and um, moderate neutron densities, um, for example, in AGB stars. 
And this moderate environment leads to um, successive neutron captures, building up heavier elements, but they in such a way or on such long time scales that they are always interrupted by beta decays. And this means the reaction paths building up heavier elements always stays um, at stability reaching up to the bismuth region here. And then we have the other big player here is the so-called R process, the rapid neutron capture process that occurs in hot explosive sites where we find extremely high neutron densities. That is, for example, a neutron star merger scenario, very famous by now. And then there is also the collapse supernovae, for example. Here we have so high neutron fluxes that um, um, extremely neutron rich species are um, created and the, the reaction path is only uh, stopped by the neutron trip line. So by unbound, by the border of the unbound nuclei. And then we have um, this reaction path evolving here up to uh, even the uranium region. And uh, after the explosion, then decay set in and populate stable uh, isotopes um, along the valley of, uh, for this heavy element. <clears throat> However, and this is what I really wanna talk about today. Um, there are about 35 nuclei that are not, that are bypassed by neutron capture mechanisms. So they all lie on the neutron deficient side and they cannot be produced by neutron capture because there's something unstable in between that usually um, decays before um, or something similar. So these so-called P nuclei, they happen to be the rarest species on the nuclear chart. And um, for to explain their origin, we need to invoke different processes, actually a variety of processes. I will only, only introduce two um, prominent ones here that are believed to contribute to a certain extent. The first one I want to talk about is the so-called gamma process that um, is the red arrow here showing the rough reaction and pass and it um, yeah, this occurs in um, in different types of supernova explosions in the hot um, hot photon bars, um, a pre-existing seed distribution, for example, from the S process, um, <clears throat> is disintegrated, um, and then in um, neutron deficient nuclei are created, and also um, these outlier nuclei, the so-called P nuclei, can be created um, along this. Uh, on, uh, along uh, in, inside the mass range um, as shown here. And then there's also the uh, so-called RP process, the rapid proton capture process that occurs in um, binary uh, systems where a neutron star starts to accrete uh, matter from its um, companion. This is usually hydrogen rich and then this hydrogen rich environment and the uh, accumulated mass on the surface of the neutron star lead to um, an ignition, a nuclear thermonuclear runaway on the surface where um, proton induced reactions, mainly proton capture reactions occur, producing elements up to the region of um, tellurium here, 110 or so. And um, <clears throat> Yeah, these are two of the processes I want to mention now, but maybe we can even go a little deeper today and look um, how the nuclear networks actually um, look in detail. <clears throat> this is for the, um, for the RP process. And as mentioned before, it is a series of proton captures along the trip line. So we have very neutron deficient nuclei building up here is actually a breakout from the hot CNO cycle um, on, the, on the surface of the neutron star and elements up to tellurium can be produced. And when we, for example, look at um, one of the key things of this um, process here, we have to look at um, Kappa 59. This is uh, a bottleneck on, 
a bottleneck for heavy element production. So all the element production above for heavier masses has to go through the proton capture on kappa 59. However, on kappa 59, there's also the P-alpha reaction, which leads, in this which leads into this closed um, nickel kappa cycle, which is something like a dead end for nucleosynthesis. So the ratio of these two reactions is something very highly interesting for nucleosynthesis <clears throat> in, the, uh, in the RP process. There's actually a very similar situation in the, uh, in the neutrino P process um, uh, in, in supernova explosions where this very same uh, ratio of reactions is responsible for a threshold, the temperature threshold that um, switches on and off uh, nucleosynthesis for heavier elements. So this is really some, um, some interesting uh, questions around this Kappa, Kappa 59. And then there's also the gamma process. Again, here we have a reaction network shown um, done several years ago. However, still nice to, to uh, still very illustrative. There is the, um, the region from gallium to bismuth shown in two um, slices and um, you can see how huge these reaction networks can be. So we have the gamma process is mainly photon induced reactions. So we have disintegration in gamma N reactions like here from the, from the stability. And then we have um, branch off branching off in the higher masses, mostly gamma alpha reactions. When we go lower, it's also gamma P reactions involved. And in that, um, in that moment, then we have a creation of the P nuclei. <clears throat> so here we have about around 1,000 nuclei involved in a network and around 10,000 reactions. And the interesting ones are photon induced, but also the reverse reactions, because in such network calculations, you need also the, always the consistent picture of uh, forward and reward, re, uh, reverse rate. <clears throat> There's also a nice um, case I want to show you. This is the molybdenum 92. Um, this is a um, a p nucleus for which the uh, the production cannot be very well uh, explained by, uh, up to now. So the compared to the other p nuclei, and molybdenum ninety two is very abundant in the solar system, and this cannot be really explained by now. Um, the production in the in the type two supernova um, occurs as shown here from um, gamma N, gamma alpha and gamma n. Uh, reactions. However, destruction via gamma P is also important. This is for the type 2 supernova, so the core collapse. In case of the hydrogen-rich um, type 1A supernova, for example, this, this reaction pass here turns around and the proton capture on niobium-91 is also very important. So this is, for example, um, a, a reaction that is also very interesting to measure, this niobium-91 P gamma. The, the status on this simulations here, on this network calculations, is that we mostly rely on theoretical information because this plays mostly in the realm of the um, unstable, unexplored nuclei. So here we do not have any experimental constraints for reaction rates, for cross-sections, which we need to model this, um, these networks. And this means we have to rely on mostly on the how the Feshbach formalism, which um, does predictions um, of these um, cross sections for all kind of um, light particle or photon induced um, reactions. And, um, but it comes with large uncertainties because we do not have any probes, any tests of this theory beyond stability. There are tests at stability and we know it's working on the order of maybe a factor of two and uncertainty. And very often this factor of two is already enough to, to leave a large uncertainty um, for, the, um, for the nucleosynthesis yield for a certain P nuclei in the network. <clears throat> okay, from the, excuse me. From the experiment point of view, um, it's clear that we want to contribute with cross-section data. And of course, the focus has to lie by now on, on data on exotic nuclei. Because on, the, on stability, there's 
yeah, there's not much more to gain, I would say. The main uncertainty is by now, how well do we extrapolate into the unexplored region? Here we have two approaches, I would say. We can, we can identify key reactions as I have shown before and address them by measurement directly. And as such, nail down um, certain situations in the network. Or we can produce constraints on a more systematic approach this is constraints um, for the underlying physics. Underlying physics for the how the Feshbach formalism, I mean, and this means mainly that we need to know how uh, global, the global picture of optical model potentials, photon strength functions that describe the interaction between light particles um, and photons and the, and the monolithic nucleus, and also um, nuclear states and level densities are very important. <clears throat> yeah, this is this is the goal, and this is the situation um, we we try to address with our experiments. Um, but how can we do that? And of course, what is needed is something like supernova-like conditions in the lab. And what is that? That means we need radioactive nuclei. We need them at low energies because this is nuclear astrophysics. Um, so the, 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 the goal is usually to investigate some uh, around one or five MeV per nucleon, uh, five MeV in, in center of mass, sorry. And, um, and of course, we need these radioactive nuclei in sufficient amount to carry out reaction studies, because as you know, reaction studies or uh, nuclear astrophysics usually involve very low cross sections on the order of millibarn, microbarn, or even lower. <clears throat> How do we do that? <clears throat> How do we support that at GSI? Um, GSI is the um, Center for Heavy Iron Research in Darmstadt, Germany. And it's known to deliver stable beams from protons to uranium. Um, yeah. And this, this is done very, very good, very reliable. And um, however, it's not what we need. We need radioactive beams. That's, uh, that is the goal. So luckily, we have, we have those stable beams at relativistic energies. And this facilitates very nicely in-flight production of exotic beams. Um, I will go into uh, some details um, in the next slides. So, but these um, secondary beams are then, can then be delivered to various experiments. Okay, so now we have the option to get exotic nuclei and study them in, in, uh, in, beam, in, in form of a beam um, at GSI, but how do we actually create stellar conditions? <clears throat> because when we talk about relativistic energies, this is definitely not stellar conditions, right? <clears throat> Yeah, and then this brings me back to the um, to the part of the facility I've shown on my um, initial slide. Initial slide, there is the fragment separator FOS, which delivers the exotic ion beams, and then there are the two storage rings, the experiment and storage ring ESR, and the so-called cry ring, the newest addition to the GSI inventory. Let's go step by step through them. This is the fragment separator. Um, it's in-flight production of exotic ions can be reached here or is usually you reached here by using fragmentation reactions on a thick beryllium target. So we have the start of the fragment separator is with this thick production target. And then you have a cocktail of fragments produced in such violent um, reactions. <clears throat> and you need to sort out the ones that you want to have. This is done using, um, okay, uh, one thing, we can also use uh, different um, reaction mechanisms. For example, Coulomb fission is uh, often used if, you, if there is need for more neutron-rich nuclei. Fragmentation, usually um, neutron-rich uh, nuclei are not uh, in focus. <clears throat> okay, so you want, you want to separate out the the fragments of interest. And this is done by a double magnetic separation stage as shown here. So this is, this is the first stage. Then we have um, 
an energy degrader here, and we have a second stage. And afterwards, we have slits. Um, there's also shown an, an FRS setting for um, a beam of tallium uh, 205, which, uh, which is um, from an experiment we did some two years ago. <clears throat> Um, here, the goal, the, the problem was that we had to uh, sort out the tallium 205 from the primary beam 206 lab and also from the um, neutron deficient 205 lab, which was produced in the same uh, fragmentation process. And this is a very tricky thing, but the main part is that you have to have the, the contaminant on the last slit and cut away as less as possible of the fragments of interest. Very tricky often. Okay, here is shown um, um, an estimate of how much intensity you can get. Don't look too close on the numbers. Just showing you how fragmentation reactions, um, the red intensity is, of course, um, close to stability, but we have still moderate intensities a bit further away. So it's perfect to study the, the two kind of processes that I have shown you before, where the key reactions are not too far away, but still um, two, three um, numbers, mass numbers um, into the neutron deficient re region. <clears throat> okay, next is the experiment and storage ring. So the ESR is one of the working horses at GSI since the late 80s, I would say. Here's shown a, a picture from that time, actually. It looks nice and shiny, but just to give you an impression how the ESR looks, this is one of the dipole magnets here in, in orange. We have six, and this makes a ring. And this is how we store, right? We, we store ions in a ring configuration by bending them um, on, an, on an orbit, on a closed orbit, just using dipoles. Beam storage here is possible for any ion that we can get from the synchrotron. Um, or from the FRS. Energies are possible up to 550 MeV per nucleon and down to 3 MeV per nucleon in terms of accelerator language, let's say. <clears throat> and one main point about the rings is the ultra high vacuum environment. Because if you store a beam in a ring, it means it circulates at very high frequencies. So it, it will cross the entire uh, circumference of the ring, which is 108 meters for the ESR, many, many, many times a second. And this makes rest gas interactions very likely. So the thing is that we need to operate the ring at a pressure of 10 to the minus 11 millibar, which is ultra high or even extreme high. So X, XUV or UHV regime, depending on the definition. This is definitely extremely challenging, especially when you talk about detector setups for particles and so on. The main point I want to, uh, we, we are using for our um, experiments is the internal gas target. Here we can have um, a large variety of gases, uh, noble gases, for example, no problem. Um, several others have also been tested. Densities, however, are not um, top if you compare international uh, gas targets, but this is of course mainly due to the um, ultra high vacuum. So for um, hydrogen, we have about 10 to the 14 particles per centimeter square. And this is also the main mm, configuration that we use because uh, we, we usually study um, proton capture reactions as I will show you in the following. And then let me briefly also um, show the cry ring. Um, it is a newest addition to the, to the TSI inventory and it is um, for low energy storage. It is installed behind the ESR. Um, and it has, um, yeah, the goal is here to, to, to extend the storage range down to 100 kV per nucleon or so. I will go, I will come to Cryring uh, at the end of my talk. So now let's go back to um, creating um, stellar conditions. What we need is in flight fragmentation in the FRS. So we have radioactive beams, but we have them at high energies. What does that mean? Uh, what, uh, what, what can we do with that? <clears throat> First thing is we store them. So this is what I what I told you already. Um, we when we store them in the rings in the ESR, for example, we we recycle the beam a million times per second, so one megahertz or something a little lower maybe. 
This means if we have a, a target, an internal target, this gives us a, a huge boost for luminosity regarding our reaction studies, very valuable. This is maybe the main point um, for going to the rings for these reaction studies. And then we have the means of manipulating the beam once it, is stored, once it is stored. This means we can, for example, give it time structure or not. But the main thing we use here for direct investigations of reactions is, of course, the post deceleration. So we store the beam and we decelerate it to the gum of window energies, which is the energy range um, I mentioned before of a few MeV <coughs> reaction energy. And then of course we apply beam cooling, otherwise um, we would have rather undefined conditions. So this gives us really high resolution, brilliant beams, and it allows us also to make very clearly fragment identification, you know, what kind of beam we have stored in the ring. <clears throat> I will show you examples of that later. Okay, and the last thing, um, maybe not last, but um, the very important thing is um, that we can also accumulate beam. That means we can increase the stored intensity by collecting several shots from the FRS. This is very valuable when we talk about low production yields, uh, uh, low intensities of exotic beams. Um, <clears throat> so here we can maybe increase the, um, the intensity by a factor of 10 or maybe even more if we squeeze out what, what is possible. All in all, this is a very, very clean preparation of beam and target, giving us low background conditions, as I will show you in the following. Now let me show you uh, what is the experimental procedure that we um, use to um, that we use to um, measure proton capture reactions. <clears throat> so we inject ions into the ring or fragments from the FRS at about 400 MeV per nucleon. This is the design energy of the ESR and mainly um, it's very important because we can then use the stochastic cooling device, which is made for this energy only and very important. You will see the effect in a, in a minute of this cooling. So here we get fully stripped fragments <clears throat> or ions if we get stable ones. Then we do deceleration and electron cooling. Um, at energies uh, something below 10 MeV per nucleon to do our investigations. We can then switch on the hydrogen target once we have um, nice conditions and we will induce proton and electron capture reactions mainly. And these two are a very good example because they are nicely separated in the next dipole here. Um, this is like a recoil separator um, feature, I would say. Um, so on the inner, tracks, we have particle detectors that intercept the heavy recoils from proton capture reactions. And on the outer tracks, we can have um, detectors for electron capture recoils. So heavy ions. Okay, this is the scheme. It's pretty simple. However, it's much complicated by the fact that the lifetime of a stored beam, the effective storage time can be pretty short. And that is of course, due to the interaction with the residual gas and also with the target, so due to the vacuum conditions in the ring. So it, the intensity in the ring drops exponentially. This can go rather quickly. I can show you in the following. And we, we have to refill the ring and do repeat this procedure periodically for our measurement. And here is um, uh, a picture of the, or a drawing of our um, setup. Part of the setup, the heart of the setup, I would say it's the ultra high vacuum compatible detector setup for our proton capture recoils. Here again, the different beams, stored beam and the product beams. And this is an example of a position map that we get from such a silicon detector here. <clears throat> so it's a double sided silicon strip detector and we get a um, hit distribution. You see that from the proton capture, we get such a nice narrow cluster of ions sitting on a smooth background, which comes from Rutherford scattering, elastic scattering at the proton, at the hydrogen target. By now we have three generations of these detectors. The first one was actually used in a detector pocket. That means behind the vacuum barrier at this position behind the dipole here, the second and by now the third 
generation are sitting inside the dipole chamber as shown in this drawing here, which is at the end of this 60 degree dipole after the target. <clears throat> and then we do normalization of these proton capture counts um, in order to calculate a cross section, not by calculating or measuring target density and uh, beam intensity, this is tedious or uh, very uncertain in the ring because of overlap issues. We do it relatively, we do normalization by using atomic physics. So we do X-ray spectroscopy and then we look at the target and we look for the so-called KREC um, signature. This is this last peak here in the X-ray spectrum. And this is um, the signature for the um, electron capture, the radiative component um, of the electron capture into the K-shell of the bare ion that circulates in the ring. The cross sections of this process are very well known and can be nicely used to, um, <clears throat> to normalize. By now, we have two uh, major published results with this technique, both with stable beams. The first one is ruthenium-69 um, proton capture on ruthenium-69, which is um, a P nucleus. This was our very successful pilot experiment several years ago. Um, here we could not reach the, uh, the gamma window because of that because of that detector pocket that prevented us from going lower, because the ions just wouldn't penetrate the, the barrier and reach the detector anymore. So we made three energy points at higher energies here, and then we had also um, a measurement of 124 xenon p gamma. Um, in 2019, this was published, and this was the, the first measurement with our ultra high vacuum compatible detector setup, and also the first measurement inside the gamma window. So, the final proof of the method for using stable beams, let's say. Here we had five energy points, and you see we compare always our results to the predictions of theory. There are large deviations. If you, if you want to create them, you can do that, so to say. Um, Usually we, we can get a local agreement with the data, which is nice. And we do that by tuning nuclear inputs of the Hauser-Feschbach models. And this is very good in order to pin down key reactions to, to solve a local problem, right? <clears throat> However, the situation remains a little unsatisfying regarding um, the, the global picture. Here we have a, a complex um, situation of sensitivities to underlying nuclear parameters. And we can often not disentangle this, um, disentangle this in any way. Um, <clears throat> I think I have examples here. So here is um, the sensitivities uh, of such a um, network, uh, uh, such a cross-section calculation shown. This is energy versus sensitivity. And you see this is for 124 xenon p gamma. And you see the sensitivity of the calculated cross section to the different components. Red here is the gamma strength function. This is the neutron um, optical potential, the proton optical potential, and the alpha optical potential. And at the energies where we are usually interested, this is in this case you, below 5 MeV, um, usually the proton potential is the one we are interested for proton uh, induced reactions. Um, however, in the, in, the, in the region where we measure, which is this intermediate region around the, um, the neutron separation threshold, uh, the, yeah, the, um, <clears throat> the situation is much more complex and we cannot disentangle, um, we cannot draw conclusions for single components. So the idea is to measure for example, a different reaction channel, for example, the PN reaction channel, where we have um, similar behavior, but turned around. So above the PN threshold, um, a few MeV above the PN threshold, the sensitivity is such that we have solely sensitivity to the proton, um, to the proton um, optical potential. So the idea would be to measure more reaction channels to draw more conclusions on the <clears throat> um, on the physics. And then, of course, we need to go for exotic nuclei. This is the main point of the campaign. And this is what we aim for. 
this brings me again to um, to the major challenges of this um, product capture campaign I'm talking about. So vacuum conditions I already introduced. I will skip this. I will just give you a number. The atomic processes that lead to losses for beam in the ring are on the order of kilobarn to megabarn. And now compare this to our pro, uh, to our nuclear cross section. This is really um, really a big problem. So the ultra high vacuum compatible setups um, need to be baked out, and so this is just a technical thing. By now, the the technology is um, is available, and we can do that. We have silicon detectors that can be baked out at 400 Kelvin. <clears throat> and then we have two more beam induced problems. One is the separation of ionization and proton capture. Ionization of a, of, a, uh, of a beam stored in a ring. <clears throat> it is the same, um, it is the, uh, it is the same um, um, mass to charge ratio that you get from both reactions. Ionization of the electron in the shell, of an electron in the shell and proton capture. So it's, the problem is that we cannot separate these recoils, these recoil ions in the dipole without detectors. So there, there's need for bare ions for our measurement. And this, of course, in some cases, you have the lifetime here of a, of a stored ion. In some cases, gives you a disadvantage. If you cannot go for the longest living charge state and measure that one, but you need to go for the, for the bare ion. And then we have Rutherford scattering, as mentioned before. This gives us a limited sensitivity because it gives us background. And this is very severe. I can show you a, an example here. We have a measurement of xenon, 124 proton capture, here at seven MeV and here at six MeV. This is just one MeV different, but you see already the, the signal to background ratio changed tremendously. And um, this gets worse if you go lower because of the divergent behavior of the cross sections. <clears throat> so we asked ourselves, how can we increase the sensitivity of our method? And um, we came up with the idea to use the, um, the energy resolution of the detectors um, that measure our ions. However, simulations compared to the measurement showing here the horizontal position um, versus the ion energy show us that this ring of Rutherford scattering that we measure here completely hides our proton capture signature. So we cannot get any or much suppression, background suppression here. However, then we, uh, we looked at the situation in this dipole, how this um, Rutherford cone in green here covers the entire detector region but it's already extended before the dipole. So the, we came up with the idea to bring in a scraping device just in front of the dipole, scraping away this annoying Rutherford um, reactions and leaving a very nice and background free signature of the proton capture. <coughs> this um, device was constructed and installed in the PhD thesis of Laszlo Varga, who also was in charge of the um, experiment, the follow-up experiment using again um, 124 xenon. Um, we remeasured the 7 MeV per nucleon data that we had already here with 20 hour measurement. You see without, with the very same, you see the very same thing that we measured before. <clears throat> so Rutherford background and a proton capture signature. And then we went and put in the scraping device and you see immediately that there is a change um, a massive change around the factor of 10 in the signal to background ratio. And you can even see that we are now able to see another reaction channel emerging, which is the PN channel here, which is very difficult to measure uh, in the um, below the Rutherford background. So this is, this is new and has been established by now. And Laszlo um, is about to publish five new data points, two on a um, Xenon um, 124 P gamma and three on the PN. And um, yeah, with this, we, uh, we hope to, to produce much stronger constraints for the Hauser Feschbach parameters. Um, I hope we can uh, go online with this publication very soon. <clears throat> and then we went finally to measure a radioactive beam. The choice was made for 118 tellurium which is a part of the gamma process network and was also selected for simplicity of the measurement. So we used again a primary beam of 124 xenon in the fragment separator 
using fragmentation reactions to produce a six days half-life beam. We got something like 10 to the nine xenon ions from the synchrotron and we obtained 10 to the five fragments after the FRS per shot. Accumulation of 20 shots and deceleration of the beam, which is also um, causing losses, leaves left us with about 10 to the six ions uh, left for measurement. And this is a very good number. We can live with this. You see the stacking scheme here, scheme here. So the ions in the ESR, the number of ions in the ESR are plotted on this axis. Sorry for the bad quality picture. And you see we accumulate 20 steps over six minutes, decelerate in energy here, and then we have a very tiny measurement phase of 15 seconds. Here is a zoom in, and you can see that our beam lifetime is only two and a half seconds, roughly. So this is the reason we measure only for five or 15 seconds. Yeah, so a very complex scheme for the accelerators. Exotic beam production, deceleration, storage, measurement. <clears throat> Now let me show you what the storage, what, what the what the actual power of manipulating beam in storage rings uh, means. This here is a is a waterfall plot from um, Schottky detector. Schottky noise detectors. This is one of these cavities here in blue. This is a very powerful non-destructive beam diagnosis, and it's one of the main devices in the ring to see what's going on. So each ion passing, so it's single ion, um, it can be single ion um, sensitive. Each ion passing introduces um, a tiny pickup signal and the time correlation between these pickup signals is um, then um, converted to a frequency um, um, yeah, using um, <clears throat> um, a Fourier transformation. And then we get this kind of frequency spectrum. So here I show arbitrary frequencies. However, um, you see the point. It doesn't matter what kind of frequency that is. So, And you see this frequency plotted versus time. In red, we have high intensity. In blue, we have nearly zero. And then what we see here is an injection and another injection. So we have um, about... Um, 13 seconds or so between two injections of the accumulation phase. And you see that this hot beam from the fragment separator after the sick beryllium target is very undefined. And we start stochastic cooling, which quickly makes a nice definition of the beam. And then, um, <clears throat> and then you can clearly see what kind of fragments we have stored. We can identify them by their um, frequency because the frequency and the known energy give you the mass. <clears throat> so we have enough resolution here. And then what we can do is something very powerful. We can, um, <clears throat> so this in the middle here is tellurium 118 bare, and we have two fragments um, that we are not interested in. And what we can do then is a high frequency excitation to shift, to take only in a very resonant way, this inner um, fragments and put them, collect them, accumulate them on the inner orbit. So this is a very selective scheme of um, accumulation of, um, of fragments in the ESR. And we do this many times until we have enough intensity uh, that we can work with. <clears throat> okay, with this scheme done for the first time um, in 2021, we, um, we accomplished a measurement of proton capture on 180 tellurium. Um, at 7 MeV, you see the signature here very clear and nice on a very low background, of course, again, due to our nice scraping device. And then we went on and measured 6 MeV per nucleon, which gives us a, a, a weaker signal, but still um, straightforward to analyze, I would say. <clears throat> the analysis is going on here. And um, Sophia Delman from Frankfurt University is on this. She has already I would say promising preliminary results. However, for now, I leave the pleasure to her to show these results. <clears throat> okay, so what's next? You can ask me now. Um, we have this established um, experiment, experimental technique for proton capture and, pro and PN reactions and for radioactive beams. So the call for new proposals at GSI will be out, will be coming out late April. And um, we consider 
the high impact cases that I talked about in the in the on my first slides. So Kappa 59 Pigamma, Niobium 91 Pigamma. But um, yeah, there's still discussion going on. Also, PN reactions on radioisotopes are discussed. But the proton capture campaign will go on with radioactive beams with more impact than we have now. And then, of course, we aim for a, an extension of the technique to priring in order to get access to the lowest energies. Let me, on my last, last few slides, um, talk about this new um, ring facility, um, the Gry ring. This is the new low energy ring. It was inherited from Stockholm University, um, where it was used for, I think, for about 20 years for molecular physics mainly. It is designed for dedicated low energy beam storage, which means um, down to a down to 100 kV per nuclear. Um, um, this is not confirmed for, for our beams yet. So I think the lowest beam energy stored up to now is uh, 360 kV per nucleon. But um, no, I'm not 100% sure. So this has to be investigated. The installation behind the ESR has been finished in 2019. Commissioning and first experiments went on in the follow up years. And there are plans to do proton induced measurements at energies around one to five MeV per nucleon, which perfectly covers the gamma window. Um, also, lower stellar temperatures are um, possible. Nova physics, for example, and um, even Big Bang physics can be um, can be considered. Okay, so one thing, maybe one point is. Um, that the ESR and the grinding together are a very unique configuration. So this double storage ring setting gives us a new freedom for improving our duty cycle, because now we can do this accumulation and preparation that I showed you with the shot key pictures in the ESR, while we measure the, um, the, the last bunch of ions um, in the, in the cry ring. So this, this scheme has not been done yet, but the idea is there and the, the development towards this, um, this um, enhanced duty cycle, at least a factor of two we hope to gain because duty cycle is one of the weak points, of course, of the, um, of the storage ring measurements up to now. <clears throat> there are also more um, problems or more challenges, let's say, um, firing is not a recoil separator even less than ESR I write here because um, the ESR has a large acceptance and our detector is, um, is able to, the position of our detector is able to intercept a lot of mass ranges, mass ranges for proton capture and, and PN reactions. We have a lot of play around and possibilities here, but this is not the case in Cryring. We need several detector stages um, after the first dipole behind the target as shown in this top view here to cover a larger range of um, um, larger mass, mass range for proton capture or similar reactions. So here we have a major upgrade um, is planned. Detector stages, new dipole chamber are already in place, and now we need um, and uh, intro, we want to upgrade also the um, acceptance in this region here to get out to squeeze out what is possible. <clears throat> okay, another big thing I want to briefly mention in cryring there is the Karma reaction chamber. Karma. Um, stands for Cryring Array for Reaction Measurements, and it is the UK project um, of Phil Woods, Carlo Bruno, and uh, Tom Davidson um, from Edinburgh University. And you see this, this monster device, which is um, constructed around the gas target here, consists of two huge reaction chambers that can be mounted upstream and downstream of the target. And it is believed to, or it is, um, um, yeah, it's a, it's a very versatile tool to study a large spectrum of mainly nuclear reactions. We can take a look inside a little. So it is mainly consisting of um, vacuum pumps and silicon detectors. Um, here's the actual installation that is um, that is um, was accomplished for the commissioning. So two uh, of this large area silicon detectors have been installed, baked out, and tested using. Um, a commissioning beam of deuterium on a hydrogen target. So no inverse kinematic here. However, the nitrogen 14 
a DP reaction was investigated in order to see the performance of the detectors and everything. This went pretty smoothly from the Karma side. We had several problems with the um, gas jet because this was also just commissioned in this beam time. However, in the end, I think we got something, uh, the Edinburgh guys are happy and they got something to chew on and to publish. And with this, I would like to thank you for listening and close with the hope that I could show you how unique the possibilities are that we have at the storage rings at GSI to study beams under, uh, radioactive beams under stellar conditions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jan. Great talk. Uh, okay, so let's go to questions. There's already one in the chat, if you can read it. It's from Oleg Tarasov. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's regarding this uh, plot you have with a uh, shotty, shotty detector, I think. The AU units. Uh, horizontal the alpha reaction. I think it's about the detector, oh, right? Yeah, that this is about the, the yeah, it's the position. Yeah. Yes. So let me get, go back to maybe to. Sorry. So this should be st strips, right? It's not. Yes. So elevated something. Yet. Each, each strip. So we have sixteen times sixteen strips here on an area of five times five centimeter square, which gives you something like position resolution, something like three millimeters, which is um, not much, but it's definitely enough for the kind of um, structure that we need to resolve, right? So this, this cluster of iron is a little bigger from the proton capture, it's a little bit bigger than the beam itself. <clears throat> um, usually something like um, maybe um, eight millimeters in, um, in full width or so of maximum, maybe five. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, can uh, I uh, now talk? Okay, it means from this picture you can measure shift by one charge. Yeah, from the projectile, it looks like you have space for to measure two charge. Is this correct? You are right in principle. Yes. Okay, good. It's perfect. But, but um, you also can measure in another direction. If you measure in another direction, it means you can really measure reaction. Let's say um, alpha uh, evaporation. P alpha, for example. If you yes. You, I mean, you are right. Um, I mean, the, the P gamma and the PN, I have shown before, right? This, this two. Yeah. Um, Correct. This but two, evidently, uh, PP, you can't do it because it will be in the projectile uh, trajectory. But yes, P but alpha, I, you can do it. In principle, you are right. The P alpha has, has another problem. It, um, the reaction. Um, uh, the alpha is is a heavy it's much heavier than a, than a proton or a neutron and if the reaction kinematics in, in inverse kinematics are such that the reaction cone grows much bigger when you spit out an alpha particle I so see. this means the reaction cone of a p alpha uh, reaction would be i think at least four times the size of our detector if we I mean, in principle, you are right. If we um, if we make a, we can make two detectors next to each other, for example, in that position, and we could cover maybe, let's say, fifty percent of the p alpha region, maybe a bit more. However, the spread out counts of a few milli millibar cross section are really hard to measure, even with our. Uh, even with our um, new scraping technique, because this scraping technique is also, yeah, not not working so nice on this big um, recoil cones because it it cuts away your big recoil cone, the one from the from the proton. Uh, um. I see, but you know also, and um, in drinks you have really very nice emitter. Yeah, you oh, yes. your target your target is a, is a gas a jet. It's perfect. You don't have windows. And you don't have, uh, let's say, struggling and so on. And it looks like, like you already told, your resolution defines only by strip size. But if I assume you have a really good uh, resolution in the detectors, probably you also can think to separate PN from P2N. Mm, P2N would be another mass. Lower, yeah, and um, <clears throat> but 
but here Q is more uh, important. Yeah, but N, I mean, it will be no. somewhere around. No, no, I think the P2N is also suffering from the same thing that than the alpha. You have two, um, two um, recoils piling up on, from the two neutrons, and they will make you a, um, a larger, a much larger recoil cone. So, in principle, we can try to do that, but the, the larger the recoil cone and the larger the spot of the reaction that we have to cover, the more difficult will be to distinguish it from the background. Okay, actually, the, the main mind is maybe it's a really uh, <laughs> crazy idea. If you go to the high Z, let's say mass 100, 200, yeah, for example, yeah. and you use alpha jet, gas alpha jet, yes. uh, you can actually even explore the fusion operation reaction if you have good resolution of the detector. Yes, I think you're right. If you go heavier in mass, even the alpha recoil will go, will be a little uh, lower and um, and the recoil cone will be, will be smaller and the situation is, is better. And of course we can, I mean, in principle, it is also thinkable to, um, to combine our measurements, uh, this type of measurement with, with something like the karma setup in, uh, around the target and then do coincidences and then you have much more freedom, yeah. right? You, you, you don't have any background at all if it works. And, um, and this, this situation or this, um, this kind of upgrades we are also thinking about. Yeah? Thank you. It's really fantastic experiment, lot of potential. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, any other questions? Uh, you can either raise your hand or just unmute yourself. And, oh yeah, there's a question by, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, hi, Jan. I was wondering, thanks for the talk, Fish. was wondering what is the sort of lowest half-life uh, radioactive beam that you could access with this measurement? Because obviously the preparation of the beam will take some time before you can then do the reaction measurement. Yeah, this is a very good question. It depends much on what you actually, what the situation actually is. Because we can, of course, optimize the cycle we do, do not need to accumulate 20 times if this is not possible. Um, so I think the minimum cycle for storing a beam from fragment separator is two minutes or so, with including deceleration and so on. <clears throat> but then you have just one shot. And then you can think about um, one more shot per uh, 20 seconds, I would say for now, but this can be optimized. It was done for the very first time. And um, this means in the end, half-life of a minute or on the order of minutes should be possible. Of course, you have to carefully take care of your decay daughters because this is a, a nice, um, or another um, strange thing, as you know, Guy, in the ring, we, we can also store decay daughters. So if you have uranium stored, and um, it decays, you will have next to uranium another beam sitting. You will see two lines in the short piece spectrum, the one growing from the decay. So you really have to take care of what you are doing, what you are looking at, what you are detecting on your detectors. This is one of the main challenges at the ring also, always to identify what you have stored <clears throat> and why. <laughs> okay, there's a question on the chat from Iris. It says, can you explain that I guess has a Feshbach excitation step. I think that's probably from the sensitivity plots. Ah, uh, no, you mean the high frequency? High frequency, uh, high frequency. Okay, sorry. Let me. Yeah, I mean, the, this uh, high frequency excitation is simply um, an acceleration or deceleration. And that, um, so here's the deceleration, which you usually, <laughs> which you, which you usually do for, want to do for all beams, right? For all beams stored, but it's not possible because it's a resonant process. And um, the high frequency captures all, only those nuclei that are in resonance. And you have to do, you, you can do this. If, if you know what you do, you can do it in this extremely selective way and do a deceleration by a minimum energy step to collect, to accumulate on the inner orbits the ions of interest. So in principle, if we, uh, if we think through this, this thing, we don't really need the fragment separator anymore. 
you, one could say, right? The fragment separator does exactly that. It separates the things that you might not be, um, that might disturb your measurement. Okay, of course, um, if you have a hundred lines here instead of three, the situation might be much more complex, yeah? yeah? But in principle, I'm talking about parallel operation of the fragment separator and the ESR both in individual experiments with radioactive field, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Can, can, sorry, can I ask a quick follow-up question? The, um, sure. the structure of this uh, excited tellurium beam looks a little bit strange. You don't have, it looks like the, the beam is going. I, I don't know how to explain it, this, this structure there. You mean the, 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 the accumulated beam on the inner orbit? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there is already beam from the prior injections. You see this very thin line, oh, sorry, this very thin line coming from the start, the time start here. This is very thin because it is cooled, electron cooled. <clears throat> um, the, the inner orbits here are electron cooled from the electron cooler, the other, the, the, other elect, uh, the other beam cooling device that we have, stochastic cooling and electron cooling. So continuous cooling on the inner orbits gives you very, very narrow um, distribution here. But then we switch off electron cooling. You see the, the old beam blows up and the new beam that is shifted here is then just next to the, to the old beam. And then these two get merged by the electron cooler. The electron cooler brings these two beams to the, uh, over time on the same velocity. And then you, you make one beam of them. Or this is what you see here, I think. Pretty cool. Okay, I think we've been over time. It's okay. Uh, yeah, actually, just one comment. I was thinking about this as sure. a fusion operation. We can actually very easy to see uh, with leaves, with leaves plus plus. Yes. Uh, all this separation, the location of all peaks, even including cross sections, we can do it with leaves. This is just, let's say, assume dipole and fusion already exists in this. Okay, I will check actually. It's really, really interesting. Sounds, yeah, sounds interesting. Let me know. <laughs> okay, I also had a question. I guess we might have time for one, one minute more. So what do you think it's, uh, would be the next, like the fourth generation for detectors for the ESR? I remember that you gave a talk like while back where you said about some solar cells to use for detectors instead of this is this. What's the status for that? Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this is a very interesting um, technical development, the solar cells. So there are certain types of solar cells that can actually be used. I think I don't have the slide in here, I'm sorry. Um, that can actually be used for heavy ion detection. On um, Usually we use the specialized um, um, space, space for made for space um, solar cells. The nice thing is that this stuff is very inexpensive, so really, really, really inexpensive in comparison to silicon, and they that you do not need a bias voltage. So these devices um, work on the funneling effect. Um, I'm not a, an expert on that, um, but they, they create their own polarity, and um, and charge collection is done. Um, naturally, let's say. Mm -hmm. Of course, the resolution is much worse than um, for silicon detectors, but the principle uh, is the same. You can get something like maybe 5% energy resolution. And the nice thing is that these um, solar cells are much more radiation hard than silicon detectors because you do not have monocrystalline stuff. You have um, a morph um, and you, you cannot break a, a crystal structure that is not there. And um, this is very important for the rings, for our because um, because this um, the vacuum breaking up the vacuum of a setup and exchange changing a, a detector and doing bake up again, this is impossible during a during a um, experiment and it's also yeah. very tedious in the in the shutdown times, and also risky. And um, <clears throat> this the development here is that we have test setups and we have collaborators in Bordeaux, um, Beatrice Jurado and so on, 
they um, which which came up with this idea actually uh, so it's old idea I think it's from the from the eighties or so and um, but the idea is not to replace our silicon detectors but to um, to get a new long term detectors in the ring installed at several mm -hmm. positions um, in the vacuum right and so, right now our long term detectors are all behind vacuum barriers. <clears throat> Okay, cool. Okay, let's thank uh, uh, Jan again for his great talk. And uh, if you want to discuss more uh, with him, I have posted already the link for the Gather Town. So we can see you there in a bit. Uh, so thanks everyone. Again, the last seminar will be in two weeks uh, from Michael Visser. Uh, have a nice uh, remaining of your day and a nice weekend. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you, Tanathis. See you in the Gather Town. <laughs>